Danao. Yes. yes. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to have you here today. <laughs> um, excited to be working together mm. on the new record. Definitely. I said to you a few weeks ago that it was so important for me to get you in here today. Yeah. Have a chat on camera. Yeah. And truly talk about the legacy and the importance of Danao. Okay, wicked. Where I want to start is this. For me, when we talk about dance floor action, when we talk about someone who has touched on so many different genres for so many different years, you are a cultural icon. Hmm. There's some artists that turn themselves into kind of household names. Estelle, Mike Skinner, The Streets, a Dizzy Rascal. Occasionally, you can be one of those unsung heroes. But on our first meet, you said to me that you didn't always want to be the front man. No. Can you expand on that for me? Well, when, when, when you're a child, because I wanted to make music since I was six, you kind of follow what's in front of you. And I wanted to sing songs and be an artist. And I thought that meant being famous and being cocky and all that sort of stuff. And then as I grew into a man, I realised that didn't really suit my personality. And um, I also, I got a job at Carfront Warehouse. So I gave up music for a little bit just before the funky run. And that was the most fun I'd ever had. So it was like I realised that there's a level of fame I can have without, without me, but I can still have a normal life kind of thing. And then since I've realised that, I'm like, you know what, I'm kind of, it's been a blessing that, if you want to call it, I'm an unsung hero or no one really puts me up there because I can walk down the street and I only get love. I think being in the background has given me more power. My first introduction to you was Mr. Fidget. Yeah. <laughs> My philosophy. Can you yeah, do, bounce. Can you do the voice still? Bounce, ba -ba -ba bounce with it. Yeah, yeah, I can still do it. Ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba. Yeah, I can still do it. Yeah. So um, at the time, everyone was buying records. At that time, musically, we were in a space where we were going from garage into grime. Like looking back at that record, what did it mean to you? And like, could you feel Garage changing at that point? When it was changing into grime, I didn't feel the change. I only felt it after Dizzy Rascal blew up. And then I was like, oh, this is not Garage anymore. This is something completely different. And when like Wiley was making Eskimo, I made Bounce. Dizzy was making I Love You. We were all trying to make Garage and rap records together. Do you know what I mean? So I've always felt like it wasn't until like those records blew up and then the next batch of records came out is when I realised that this, this is a new scene. Is UK Funky coming back? Um, I don't think scenes come back. I think they, they influence new scenes. I feel like UK Funky is influencing um, the UK version of Ama Piano. And that's what's, come, that's what's gonna come. And then the public are gonna name that something. It's not for us to name it. Right now, we can see that Funky and Amma Piano are being mixed together, but the public are eventually gonna come up with a name. What is it about that Amma Piano, I mean, it's explosion at the moment. For you, what is it about that genre, that scene, that culture, that's even inspiring you as a producer? Do you know what, right? I think Funky was my favourite era of production. And I'm a Piano was like, oh, I get to make this like, kind of stuff again. I get to be experimental and like make obscure records. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know Lockdo and Lingo are quite obscure for rap records within themselves, but 114, 128, those BPMs, you get the drums right, everyone's dancing. Everyone. Everyone's dancing. And for me, I'm a piano has a similar, like, they, don't, they may not even realise this. Some of their drum patterns are from Kenny Dope. I can play you a Kenny Dope record and I can play you a Cabs the Small record and I can show you, like, Kenny invented this drum pattern and they've recycled it and changed it up and do you see what I'm saying? And it was like, okay, I can do this again. There's one record that I have to talk about today because I mentioned about your status as like a, um, a cultural icon and there's one record that we spoke about the day that I came to your studio in West London. African and we Warrior. Met. African Warrior because 
I watch Jay Huss now. I watch um, Anthony Joshua walking out to Fela Kuti. Yeah, yeah. No one at that point was waving the flag for Africa. Yeah. Because of what the media were doing at the time, what we know what they were doing, it was difficult for anyone to be proud and stand up. You brought out African Murray and changed everything. Yeah. I, I, I didn't realise that until after. After Funky is when I realised. Ty was the first one, uh, rest in peace. Like, we, I was just walking one day and he stopped me, but it was bare aggressive. So I had my back up and he said, no, sorry. If no one else hasn't told you this, you, you've destroyed the barrier between West Indians and Africans in this country. Now everyone's just black. I want to say thank you. And I was like, rah. And I, every time people talk to me about African warrior, I, maybe I was lucky at a period when it wasn't cool to be African. Because when I lived in Ghana for a period, so I've got, a, I've got a different connection to Africa than here. I've lived there, I've played with the clay. When I, I've walked for an hour with my cousins to get water from the well, and I've done all that. Do you know what I mean? So when it came to like African warrior, I was only just being myself. And at the time as well, the people I was playing it to, they were like, oh, you're going to alienate the West Indians and da 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 and, and I just kind of thought, I'm not trying to alienate anyone. I just had a vibe. I like the vibe and I'm going to put it out there. And you know what's funny as well? My friend Anton, he told me this about African Warrior. He said what was genius for him was that you sang about being African in Patois. Twist. Yeah. So you listen to the verses, the verses are like English patois. Yeah, yeah. I just remember because in clubs, Bashment records, reggae records, it was cool and it was popular to be West Indian. Mm. The media would show sandy, beautiful beaches and Bob Marley smoking a spliff and it was just beautiful. Everyone wanted to be associated with the Caribbean. Yeah. It didn't show anything about Africa. It was always hungry children or, mm. or, or, or charities or donations. African warrior, was the beginning of me realising how important I am to British black music culture. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm changing personalities and mindsets. It's bigger than just the music. As much as you're dancing to it, it's, it's, do you know what I mean? So I think African Warrior was definitely like, oh, God's blessed me with that gift. If we take things into the present moment, we've got a brand new record. Terry Walker, yeah. how was it working with Terry? It's always banging, like when I was um, 13, 12, she was my singing teacher. So Terry, like, so obviously look, anyone, anybody who gets real success for the first time, it goes to your head. Because you haven't dealt with that level of power and attention. You don't know how it's gonna deal with your emotions. You might eat too much, you might act like a, a, an idiot, you might, be a bit arrogant, you might spend too much money, it's gonna go to your head. And I remember, like between like 13 and 14, I'd see her every week with another woman called Alison, they teach me how to sing and do my notes and stuff like that. I must have been like 21, 22, and she saw me and I was a bit stush because I'm growing up now and I'm in a rough environment. So and she just ran up to me and said, don't be stush with me. Are you mad? Don't be stupid. And I, I and, and, and I couldn't firm the, the, the stiff. I can hear her saying it. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was laughing. I was like, ah, oh, all right, cool, cool, cool. And she always reminds me of that. But like, that's the type of relationship I have with her. She's like an older sibling. Rich history in music, great songwriter, great vocalist. Mm. The hookup, it makes total sense. Well, we'll wrap things up. We'll say that your importance, not just to dance music in general, but to black culture, particularly in the UK, has been phenomenal. Every DJ will reach for Danelle Records. Thanks. We're so happy to be working with you. I'm happy to be working with you guys. And it's exciting times ahead. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for coming down, man. Safe, man. Thanks for having me, bro.